Good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone, depending on the, which side you, of the Atlantic you are. And welcome to our event, uh, Powering Tomorrow, a conversation about energy innovation. Uh, we live in critical times for the climate, for energy and for transportation. And in this event today, we want to discuss the question of how innovations in energy and especially in the transportation sector uh, can be translated into policy and see uh, wider adoption. So uh, my name is Benjamin Bowman and I am the CEO of SwissNex in Boston and New York. Uh, we work as a, a Swiss consulate for science here on the East Coast. Uh, I am here with uh, my colleague Joya Deutscher, uh, who is my counterpart on the West Coast uh, and the CEO of SwissNex in San Francisco. So I believe you may be able to see her as well. Um, together, we represent two locations of the global SwissNex network, uh, which connects uh, Switzerland and the world in education, research, and innovation. So in total, we currently have five locations and are represented uh, in about uh, 20 Swiss embassies uh, worldwide. This event concludes the eighth edition of the Swiss-US uh, Energy Innovation Days, a two-day conference with about 30 speakers uh, that we have organized in partnerships uh, with uh, the Swiss Federal Office of Energy. Uh, we currently have two live broadcasts, so one um, directly into Hopin, the online platform we have used over the past two days uh, for the conference, and one into Zoom, uh, where we can welcome uh, newcomers, I believe, who have joined us, uh, especially for this public event. So before I hand over uh, to Joya to introduce our moderator today, I want to thank uh, the Swiss Federal Office of Energy again, uh, and all of you to uh, join uh, these two uh, conferences and events, mm -hmm. uh, and I wish you an inspiring and, and, uh, and, and uh, productive uh, event. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Um, thank you also to the Swiss Federal Office of Energy, which has been a great partner on this project for all those years. And um, we are very proud here in San Francisco to be a junior partner on the program this year. And um, with this, no further ado, I think it's time to introduce um, our moderator of this last closing event for the Swiss US Energy Innovation Days. And that is Katie Stebbins. She's a good friend of Swissnex and um, she is the executive director of the Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute at Tufts University. She was previously the inaugural secretary for technology innovation and entrepreneurship for Governor Baker in Massachusetts. And there she led state investment efforts in clean energy, cybersecurity, health tech, robotics, and advanced manufacturing. Katie is formally trained as an environmental planner. She worked in both Springfield and Holyoke in Massachusetts for nearly 20 years, designing and implementing technology-driven projects for ecological and economic sustainability. Katie has launched three of her own companies. She is an innovator in residence at the MIT Sloan School and earned a master's degree in regional planning from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And with this, uh, thank you so much, Katie, for uh, moderating this panel. And we look forward to this really interesting exchange. Thank you. Thanks, Joya. It's my pleasure. And thanks, Benjamin. And you know, I say this every time I do this on Zoom that I just can't wait until we're doing this in person again. I've had a pleasure of facilitating a Swiss Next event in person in Boston, and it was just so much fun. And this is my second one on Zoom. And um, it's just such a joy to be here with you all, but it's always a joy to see you in person. I think we're getting closer and, uh, and I, I really can't wait. So thank you so much, Joy and Benjamin for having me and for Swiss Next for asking me. Um, I'm really excited today to be moderating this international panel um, of two incredible leaders, uh, each in our own countries. Um, we're going to be talking to Andrew Wishnia today from the US Department of Transportation and Benoit Riva um, from the uh, Swiss Federal Office of Energy. And you know this intersection of energy and transportation, two huge systems in our world. I mean, when we talk about big systems that we have to interact with, the intersection between these is so profound. And I think today having two speakers, um, our colleague from Switzerland, who's very, very steeped in the energy side, and Andrew, who's very, very steeped in the transportation side, and, and both with a knowledge of the intersection of the two um, will lead us to a lot of interesting conversations um, I've shared with our speakers, I, I do right now lead a Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute, and I do believe that the intersection of these with our food, our global food system, 
This is where we have to start talking about multiple systems, multiple sectors talking to each other so that innovation and applied innovation can truly create changes in the market and in policy and in governments in the world that lead us all to a better quality of life. And so I'm really excited about this conversation today. Um, so with that, forgive me as I look down a bit, as I introduce our two speakers, I'm gonna introduce them both and then I'm going to hand it over to them to give brief introductory comments. So our first speaker today will be Andrew Wishnia. He is the new, new, congratulations, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate Policy at the US Department of Transportation. Andrew previously served at the US Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, including as a senior policy advisor and also served at the Federal Highway Administration as special assistant for policy to this agency's administrator and as a senior program manager for the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Andrew previously served in the US uh, House of Representatives as a legislative assistant to Congressman John Yarmouth, who is now chairman of the US House Committee on Budget, an important position indeed, and a good connection to have, Andrew. That's great. Um, and then our speaker from Switzerland, Benoit Riva, is the state secretary and director of the Swiss Federal Office of Energy, I believe it's referred to as the SFOE, if I'm, if I'm understanding this correctly. Uh, Benoit was appointed to head, uh, head of SFOE in 2016. This agency is a part of the Swiss Federal Department uh, Ministry of the Environment, Transport, Energy, and Communications. In this position, Benoit is responsible for the preparation and implementation, implementation of Switzerland's energy policy. The key current focus areas are electricity market design, security of electricity supply, something that I also hold near and dear to my heart, Benoit, we should talk about that, uh, energy efficiency policies and programs, and overhaul of climate legislation to enable Switzerland to meet its commitment under the Paris Agreement and regulation related to nuclear phase out and siting of nuclear waste disposal. So that is a lot of expertise between two countries to end this event with today and to jump into over the next hour. Um, I would like to turn it over to you, Andrew, first to give opening comments, um, you know, frame, frame the conversation from, from your position for us. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Thank you to Swiss Next. Uh, Benoit, thanks uh, so much for, for joining this panel discussion with me. And I understand that uh, we have some Department of Transportation participants from the, uh, from the U.S. Department of Transportation, um, including uh, Shelia, and, and thanks so much to our international office for all of their work um, with respect to, to Switzerland and around the world. Uh, as Katie mentioned, I'm Andrew Wishney. I'm the new Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate Policy at the Department of Transportation. Um, and really, we're, we're looking to, um, to uh, align um, our activities at the Department of Transportation um, to substantially reduce emissions to the greatest extent possible to align with the President's directive of net zero emission by 2050 and a 50% reduction by 2030. And really, I think sort of the topper that I wanted to um, provide for this discussion is, is not so much the what, because I think a lot of folks are probably familiar with the what, but more about the how. How are we sort of thinking about this? And I think at a top line, we're thinking about four buckets to get to net zero emission by, by 2050. And by, by the way, these are not um, th these are not uh, outcome determinative as to get to net zero by 2050, but I, I think they'll be helpful. So we are thinking about how we go about creating options to reduce trips, how we create options to shift trips, uh, improve trips, and remove emissions. Um, and by reducing trips, one of the things that we're looking at at the Department of Transportation is unlocking idle land on existing transportation rights of way to reduce waste encourage deployment of clean energy infrastructure and support new revenue streams for state departments of transportation. We're looking at prioritizing fix it first in that bucket to make repair and maintenance a top priority, uh, assess opportunities to address induced demand, encourage dig once and expansion of broadband deployment, uh, encourage technology to, redu to reduce trips, whether it's digital construction, UAVs and, and so forth. And also, you know, what you, um, what you manage, you, you end up uh, being able to, to measure. And so we're also looking at a, at a performance management regime, which includes 
you know, possible new performance measures for greenhouse gas emissions as well. So that's sort of the reduced trips bucket. We're also looking at uh, options to shift trips. And by the way, we're not trying to necessarily force anyone outside of their car, but where it makes sense to do so, we are looking to encourage and improve transit options, encourage and improve rail options, expand access to and promote the use of other climate-friendly modes of, of transportation, including expanding pedestrian infrastructure, bike infrastructure, micromobility. Um, and then um, in addition to reducing trips and shifting trips, Katie, we're, we're also looking at improving trips. So we have the existing transportation system, you know, in, in our country um, that that's, you know, created a lot of good, but it has also had some detrimental impacts, particularly for, you know, so-called environmental justice communities for, for disadvantaged communities. So how do we sort of create a, a paradigm where we're able to improve the existing transportation system? And that includes transportation electrification, you know, creating programs and policies to support the deployment of electric cars, trucks, buses, and charging infrastructure. It includes supporting the development and use of climate-friendly alternative fuels. So that includes zero emission fuels, but it also includes sustainable aviation fuels for our aviation sector, uh, improving system operations, corporate average fuel economy standards, climate data and modeling improvements. Um, so that's sort of the improved trips bucket. And then finally, um, in terms of you know, reducing emissions, that, that will be a, a substantial benefit. But how do we actually remove and extract emissions as well? That's probably what will be needed as, as well to align to net zero by 2050. And by that, we're also looking at major nature-based solutions, technology solutions, and we're looking at tackling embodied carbon, which constitutes about 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions, more than the entire agricultural sector combined, combined at this point. So um, hopefully that's, that's sort of a helpful frame to, to think about what we're doing at the Department of Transportation, reduce, shift, improve, and remove. And from there, I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions and th thanks again for having me. Fantastic, Andrew. That's a wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm writing down all of these notes uh, to follow up on and just uh, a lot of questions and a lot of exciting things. And I'm, I'm sure Benoit has, has his own comments and then also is, is also thinking about a lot of reactionary things at the same time. So with that, Benoit, I'd love to invite you to uh, join us and give your opening remarks and set the stage uh, as Andrew has done for the conversation to ensue. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, uh, Andrew, uh, for, for your introduction. And good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, Switzerland has a similar goal as it aims also to have a net zero emissions by, by 2050. And, and of course, the transport sector is the, the largest uh, emitter of uh, emissions in Switzerland and will play a, a central role uh, in uh, achieving our, our climate uh, targets. And to come back to your remark, Katie, we see that uh, climate goals uh, go to energy goals and also will have impact on the way the people move, to, the way material and goods are being uh, moved uh, in the future. And looking, looking into the past, uh, Switzerland has been successful um, in model shift. And uh, we, we have our... Our flagship uh, policy, it's our heavy vehicle fee. And this is, this is levied on, on tracks, depending on the, on the weight and the, the kilometers driven. And um, it makes, it, it pushes the, the transporters, the, the hauliers to, to make their truck fleets more, more efficient. And um, it also allowed to, to, to finance uh, our rail uh, infrastructure, and notably uh, our San Gotardo based tunnel that was uh, this is the world's longest uh, railway uh, tunnel. Um, as a result of our, our model shift policy, we have the highest uh, share of rail for passenger transport or and freight transport in, in Europe. Uh, for, for passenger transport, it's 16%. Uh, if we include uh, the, the public transport on roads, we go up to 19%. Uh, 
and on the freight transport, it's 37%. Uh, and, and in the history, it's amazing because the, the, today we, uh, our railway energy comes from, from hydropower. But our country decided to develop rail transport with its own hydroelectricity uh, just after uh, First World War and after suffering from uh, prices of imported coal during the war that was not, the country was not able to, to pay anymore for. And, and some people can see here a parallel with our current energy transition as we aim to foster uh, domestic renewable energy and to reduce our, our dependency on uh, imported uh, fossil fuels. So in spite, of, in spite of the relatively high share of rail transport, electricity accounts for less than 4% uh, of Switzerland's transport energy. So we are still a long way from an electrified transport sector. And we, we also have the least efficient car fleet in Europe. The Swiss people buy large cars, more than 50% of new cars are four-wheel drives. So these drives to, to cars that are rather inefficient. So the big challenge uh, that remains to, to make our transportation more uh, sustainable um, we can see that the overall de demand for transport services will continue to increase. Um, existing policies such as tighter vehicle fuel standards, electrification, um, are not decarbonizing our transport sector uh, fast enough. And we have just achieved, achieved our net zero 2050 modeling. And for the transport sector, we can identify uh, four main uh, developments. First of all, the share of battery electric vehicles uh, will have to grow rapidly. And uh, we can see that in 2050, uh, the stock of battery electric vehicle uh, uh, will be around 3.6 million vehicles out of a uh, bit more than 4.5 million vehicles. So it's, a, it's an enormous transformation over the next uh, 25 years that will happen and a big challenge uh, because these vehicles are more than vehicles, but are also batteries and consumers. Um, what we can see as a second uh, development is that uh, on, in the long term, biofuels and hydrogen will also play an important role in heavy goods transport. Uh, with a part of uh, hydrogen being uh, produced uh, in Switzerland. We can see as a third development that electricity-based fuels will be needed to reduce the greenhouse gas uh, emission to zero. Um, we, there, will be, there will be some consequences uh, as these uh, fuels are high energy cost and low overall energy uh, efficiency. And as some 70% of uh, Swiss citizens are living in urban area, uh, rail as well as human powered mobility will play uh, an additional important role in the future. This is the force, um, the force development we can identify. But still, a lot remains to, to be done. And we have two kinds of tools uh, in, in Switzerland. Uh, on one side, the regulatory measures, but we also work on, on voluntary measures. And we signed at the end of 2018 um, a roadmap, electromobility, together with, with industry stakeholders, cantons, municipalities, uh, with the aim to increase uh, the share of electric vehicles uh, in new passenger car registration. And we can identify an acceleration there, and it's uh, we can discuss later on, probably linked to the diesel scandal uh, and the introduction of new vehicles uh, on the market. We also see uh, on the voluntary basis, a Swiss corporation uh, introducing the world's largest uh, hydrogen truck fleet. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday in my introduction, it is planned to have uh, 1,600 trucks by 2025. 
And this is a private initiative by large retailers and, and technology providers uh, profiting from, from the exemption uh, from fuel tax and heavy uh, duty uh, vehicle levy. An important part of the development will be relied to the digitalization uh, to enable a more efficient use of transport means and infrastructure, uh, in particular through the sharing economy. In Switzerland, we have a long tradition in car sharing. The, the first ventures were launched in the late uh, 80s, and it has been continuously enhanced and complemented with bike, scooter sharing, uh, public transportation schemes, uh, and electric vehicles. And we are uh, experimenting the first, the first trials with uh, automated cars and minibuses in urban uh, areas. Uh, these first trials are ongoing. Of course, to put all these developments, all these technologies uh, together uh, and to reduce uh, the carbon intensity of transportation, innovation will be key not only to develop the single technologies, uh, but also to develop the solutions and to uh, go on a broader uh, value chain uh, in the future. So we are welcoming initiatives of creative companies that are contributing to, to make this transition more to sustainable mobility happen. Uh, and uh, there is only 25 years now, 28 years to achieve this goal. So. Let's start right now. Thank you for your attention. That's excellent, Benoit. Those were both really, really thought-provoking opening comments. Um, as both of you are speaking, and you are both from very specific agencies in your countries, the, the big plans that you're laying out, the, the big changes that you're laying out, um, that requires a lot of interdepartmental, interdisciplinary. It requires a lot of moving pieces to be coordinated at the same time. I would love to know, and Andrew, I'll start with you. How are we seeing this approach on a national level trickle down to multi-pronged agency strategies, strategy plans, metrics? Um, because you can't do it just with one department. There are so many pieces of the, of the puzzle here to work at the same time. What is your experience with how well this, this mandate is trickling down across the board and in, in creating that, that continuity? Andrew, I'll start with you. So the good news, I, I think that's a great question. The good news, at least from the United States side, is we have a very specific direction from the president and from, um, from the administration um, to do everything that we can to make sure that uh, we have ambition for climate. So in addition to net zero by 2050, and a 50% reduction by 2030. The president also released uh, what we call in the United States, the American Jobs Plan. And that's really a transformative plan to sort of rethink and transform America's uh, infrastructure. So that includes ambition for rail, for transit, for ports, for highways, um, really across every single mode. And just to give you know, folks on this call a sense, um, in terms of level of ambition, and this is all above and beyond baseline, so above and beyond, above and beyond existing spending, but the president has called for $80 billion above baseline for rail. The president has called for investing double the amount that we currently spend for, for transit, uh, which amounts to $85 billion over baseline. Um, it, the president has called for a $6 billion healthy ports program to promote um, electrific electrification inside the gate. So that's cold ironing, uh, charging infrastructure, um, anti-idling technologies. Um, and then I think the really good news about the American Jobs Plan is it, it really embeds climate and, um, and resilience into all of our activities, into aviation, ports and waterways, rail, um, and, and so forth. One thing that I, I did want to lift up, Katie, it, and this goes to sort of Benoit's points with respect to electrification, particularly, is we have a $174 billion um, ambition for transportation electrification. Um, and, and that obviously would transform our transportation system 
um, to solve for climate ambition, uh, to help solve for climate ambition, to solve for a lot of our, our equity and, and safety challenges as well. And that 174 is broken down into uh, several different components. And that includes $15 billion to build 500,000 electric vehicle chargers, $100 billion for consumer rebates for electric vehicles, $25 billion for transit vehicles. I could sort of go, go on and on, but it's basically an incentive strategy to make sure that we're scaling. And I think to your question, um, a lot of this is going to, a, a, an overwhelming amount is going to depend on state and local actors but we want to empower them and create the right sort of incentive structures to make sure that they're building at a sufficient scale so that we're meeting the moment. You know, we, we feel like we have one moment, one, one chance, one opportunity, and we want to do as much as we can with it. I'm sorry, Katie. No, yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah. and, and Benoit, I'd be interested in your, in your approach to this too. I mean, Andrew, it also requires the Commerce Department to do economic incentives to transfer gas station land uses. And you know, it creates housing and urban development's got to think about how we create social and economic justice equity as we're transforming this. So I guess I, you know, there are there are many pieces of the puzzle in any government federally, they're going to cover a lot of parts of this. And if one hand doesn't talk to the other, I think you we can fall very short of creating a complete solution. Uh, Benoit, I'd love to know in Switzerland how how you address this. How do you think about all the different parts of government? matriculating these mandates into their plans and strategies? Yeah, thank you, Katie, for the, for the question. Uh, uh, one of the complexities coming from the different layers we have uh, uh, between the federal competencies, the cantonal, and the municipalities where different competencies are, are given. And on, on the conventional uh, activities, meaning uh, the public transportation, um, and the, the frame is, is given and the way the, the money is being spent, it, the projects are being planned, developed, and then uh, implemented, it, it works well. And the level of, of uh, public transportation we have is one of the highest in the world. The big challenge will be to combine uh, the different uh, modes um, uh, in order uh, to to improve the the, F, the global efficiency of all the system, and as we can see in the energy sector uh, distribution decentralization going with the decarbonization uh, together, um, the main uh, elements of of the future um, mobility energy center will be uh, the building the building itself. The building that is producing, that is using energy, that is storing energy, and it allowing uh, uh, to recharge uh, a vehicle, and and this is a, a huge, uh, a huge change that will happen uh, over the, the already happening, but will accelerate over the next uh, the next decade. That's really exciting. One of the things I certainly wanted to, and it follows up on that, Ben was. I think we can get so caught up in the negative story around climate change, the challenges that we have, the big problems. There's also, I believe, a really good news story to have. Things like we're talking about how does a building self-sufficiently power the cars that are charging in the garage. So um, I'd love to hear from both of you, and Andrew, we'll go back to you. What are some of these innovations that when they come across your desk, you know, and this is sort of like that you see in the next zero to five years, you're like, these are game changers. These are actually possible from a commercial and from a policy side, right? Because sometimes we see things that are that are look really good on the commercial side, and you know, on the policy side, self-driving cars is one of them is a real is a real challenge, right? So, I'd be interested in what are what are those innovations in front of you right now that you are just really excited to get to market and get to society. Uh, that, that's a great question. And just to button up the, your previous question, I, I think just to get to the nub of it, we really need a whole of government strategy, right? This notion of having sort of siloed decisions, uh, particularly when we're thinking about a clean energy future in the United States, that's going to depend on not just the U.S. Department of Transportation, but that's going to depend yeah. on, on EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Energy, different White House components including the National Economic Council, the Council on Environmental Quality. So it has been sort of a, a key 
uh, term of art <laughs> that we are per pursuing a whole yeah. of government approach. And that bears out um, particularly in the electrification space where we're working really hand in glove on an interagency basis, not to just think about deploying 500,000 chargers, but what are sort of the, the vision and values associated with those chargers. And that I think leads to this question with respect to innovation. I think electrification you know, is going to have some very significant benefits. One of the things I think we have to remind ourselves about is, is why are we innovating, right? We shouldn't just be innovating for the sake of innovating, but we should be innovating to solve for equity, to solve for climate, to solve for safety. And I, I don't have to tell Benoit this related to safety. I think Switzerland is probably one of the foremost leaders in the world with, with respect to zero emission um, strategies. But, um, but I, I think that's how we're thinking about innovation, Katie. And so, you know, with respect to transportation electrification, I think we're seeing that incremental cost come down and we wanna do as much as we can to, to create the right sort of an incentive structure. In, in addition to electrification, I think electrical transmission and really providing the, the um, grid to provide a, a clean energy future. So when you're charging, you're actually using solar, you're actually using wind, you're actually using uh, renewables. Um, so having sort of a high voltage direct current electrical transmission line, a clean energy grid, uh, an electrified transportation system. Um, I, I think that, th you know, those are all innovations that, that we're keen on. I think, you know, more globally, we're also um, working intently. Our international offices is, is working intently on sustainable aviation fuels um, and, and doing as, as much as we can to reduce emissions there. Um, and then I think drone technology, UAVs, is also a fascinating area where we can probably leverage technology to substantially reduce emissions as well. Yeah, and that's an area where food systems come into play because a lot of the ag tech work that's happening right now is relying on a lot of new drone technology to maximize crop yields and to understand uh, how to do that efficiently. So it's another example where the systems are intersecting. You know, I, I do a lot of work in innovation in Switzerland and the US are usually in any international index vying for the top spot of being the top uh, innovative countries in the world. And so, um, you know, Benoit, I, I was fascinated. I didn't realize that your rail system back in, you know, many years ago was, was um, fueled on hydropower out of necessity, which is an innovation in and of itself. What, you know, I'll ask you the same question. You guys have been such innovators. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear what sort of the next, uh, the, you know, what's the next mountaintop with the picture behind you? What's the next mountaintop that you guys are climbing that you're most excited about? When we are talk talking among experts uh, about the different developments and new technologies, and so we are, we are a bit fascinating and we fall in love with these, those technologies. Um, but, but I think what we have not to forget is the, is the customer uh, perspective um, and how, how can we make the life of the people better, the people that have to go to work in the morning, that have to, to, to commute from one place to the other, the, the people that are active in the, the business, uh, transporting, uh, transportation, the transportation of, of freight. And, and this is probably where the, the biggest challenge, because most technologies are available today, uh, but how do we put it together to, to really address uh, the big challenges of a uh, traffic jam, of, um, of uh, costs, of uh, speed of uh, transportation, uh, in order to, and, and the cost uh, is, a, is a big part of it, uh, in order to improve the life of, uh, of the people. And per, what we had during the last, um, the last uh, 15 months will probably be a big game changer because we saw that it is possible to do it uh, differently. Yeah, that's such a great point. Andrew and I were speaking before the panel about congestion and commuting and how with so many of us working from home over the past year, one of the biggest factors to people not wanting to go back to the office now is not a fear of uh, a COVID virus, but it's a fear of having to sit in traffic again. You know, I live 18 miles from my employer and it takes me about an hour and a half to get to work each way. Um, that's just ridiculous. And so um, I think that that's a really good point. Um, 
a little bit further on the innovation front, and certainly it's a Swiss Next event, so it's a very appropriate question. Um, and Andrew, again, I'll go back to you. How are you paying attention to what the startups are doing? The innovation space, the, the new, the entrepreneurs and the new companies coming out, the new technologies. I know at a local level, it can sometimes be easier to see those, but at a national and a federal level, it can be more challenging to pay attention to the startup space and adopt new technologies. What are you guys doing in your respective roles to pay attention to new innovations coming out from startups? So we do have uh, a what we call a Build America Bureau that's housed within the Department of Transportation. And the Build America Bureau really is in charge of financing projects across the department, regardless of, of the mode of, of transportation, including for uh, highway projects or for rail projects in the like. And part of, I think the, you know, the, the Bureau's sort of purview is reaching out to um, uh, business, um, in, including, uh, but not limited to, uh, to startups. And, and we're trying to really encourage that at a greater scale um, to let folks know about different opportunities, um, including uh, transit oriented development, um, and also more of the uh, traditional infrastructure. But I think you're right, Katie, that, that we need to, you know, think about doing as much as we can to reach out to, uh, to startups, um, because a lot of sort of the business line at the Department of Transportation uh, and across uh, government, for that matter, I think is going to change over the next several years, you know, not just with respect to trans transportation electrification, but clean energy deployment more broadly. You know, Benoit brought up, and, and you and I spoke before, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, about sort of teleworking and, and kind of the new normal. I think we're going to have to rethink, you know, things like broadband and whether that should be considered, you know, part of sort of a, have a greater purview at the Department of Transportation, right? If we can... Especially um, if roads are censored. I mean, if we're putting sensor technology in roads that rely on communication, that rely on communicating with vehicles, absolutely. you're going to have to start thinking about how many places, I mean, in America, a lot of America does not have broadband internet access, which is right. a real problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and you know this so well. So I think like from also from an equity standpoint and environmental justice standpoint, we need to make sure that, um, that everyone is connected to the greatest extent possible. And that also sort of redounds for our transportation system. It has the potential to, you know, not only lower emissions, but reduce congestion, you know, to your, to your point, Katie. So yeah. I, I think we're, we're thinking about how to reach out to startups and a variety of different spaces. We obviously need to be doing so much more um, but but the good news is is that we have a foundation to build upon. Excellent. And Benoit, how about how about you? How what is the interface that you have in Switzerland? I imagine between organizations like Swissnext, certainly as we do in the U.S. Andrew with academia with higher ed. What is what does that function look like for you in sourcing innovation? So we have different different programs in order to to support. Uh, research and development on energy matters and, and of course it goes to, to transportation buildings and different uh, uh, related topics and then we have a dedicated program for for pilot and demonstration projects and these are not uh, universities but also uh, companies or startups uh, working on this is for for technologies that have been uh, proven in the laboratory and and have to need help to 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 go to the market to make the first uh, step uh, to the market. And we just launched this year a new program um, uh, called SWEET um, in order to bring not only to support not only pilot projects on technologies, but dedicated to solutions. So we are addressing a, a problem, uh, the, for example, the integration of new renewables uh, in, in the, the, the grid. And, and the contribution it can have uh, for the, the security of supply. And then uh, there are consortium um, being put with universities, startups, and uh, incumbents uh, that uh, can uh, deploy a project uh, supported by uh, the Swiss Federal Office of Energy. Mm, that's, a, that's a fantastic uh, infrastructure that you have in place there. It's really excellent. And 
And I think uh, the size of Switzerland makes it a little more easy to everyone to know each other and, and get their hands around each other, but certainly Andrew and the if, if I may add, the, the, yeah. the main challenge is then uh, for, the, for the good ideas to, to find a place on the market because the Swiss market is a very small market and that's right. where uh, the, the good ideas have uh, to, to get, get broader and, and to prove uh, if they are good enough, uh, the, the, then the judgment of the market is the, the real one. And this is why we have such great bilateral relationships in the U.S. with so many organizations like a Swissnex, because uh, the U.S. is a great customer to be able to prove out markets with. And I think there's a lot of collaboration there that's really, really excellent. Um, I wanted to go quickly to, we have a few questions, a little bit of time left, some questions of people that are asking questions on the chat. Um, Andrew, one of them that comes to you really speaks to you know, how do we look at clear direction for policy and lawmakers who are local? Um, I think that's such a challenge of the trickle down. You know, I always say to people when the US highway system was built, right? It was a national plan to build a highway system. New Jersey didn't sit there going, God, I really hope 95 goes through New Jersey. Someone in Washington just decided that 95 was gonna go through New Jersey and you didn't, you just knew, right? A system got built that was national, right? And, and how, are, how is that going to happen in this country? We've gotten so devolved into states' rights and local rights. And, the, and to the person's question, our local leaders need to have the tools, but our local leaders have to also see to a national big picture that we need some leadership on. And, and what are your thoughts on that? Because we so can't ad hoc of, this. We're not going to get to the promised land by ad hocing this piecemeal. I, th I think that's that's absolutely right. And in part of you know what the president has um, put forward with respect to the American Jobs Plan is not just ambition and not just a what, but a how. Right. I, I think too often we have a conversation about sort of what needs to be funded, but what we also need to have a conversation about how those programs, um, how those programs are actually designed and, and implemented. Um, and that really will help solve for a lot of a lot of climate ambition. Um, so we're working, you know, just to that that person's question, we're working right now with um, both folks on the Hill in, in Congress and in, in both chambers and stakeholders across the country um, to really design uh, the programs around the American Jobs Plan for rail, for transit, for, for highways, for our ports, waterways, and so forth, um, at a level of ambition that responds to the urgent need that we, we have um, with respect to our, our climate. I, you know, a, a lot of people talk about this being sort of once in a generation Katie, it might actually be once in a lifetime. We, we might not actually ever have another opportunity for this level of ambition, both in terms of sort of dollars and cents, but also in terms of policy reformation. Um, so we're working to accomplish that right now. And, um, and, and there's a surface transportation reauthorization process in the United States that's, uh, that's going on currently. Um, the Highway Trust Fund la lapses at the end of September. So our, our hope and what we're working, you know, what we're endeavoring to accomplish is to get a new surface transportation reauthorization before, before that authorization lapses or, or before we need an extension. And, and also just because we, we need that investment now, right? We need it in terms of jobs. We need it in terms of the economy. We need it to solve for, for equity, climate, and so many other administration priorities. One other thing I did want to mention, just in terms of what, what sorts of policies are being actualized, and Katie, you and I might have spoken about this briefly before, um, before the audience joined us. Um, last month, the Department of Transportation released a, a new document that is really causing state departments of transportation to rethink their transportation rights of way. So for the past 60 years or so, uh, state departments of transportation have thought, you know, more in terms of kind of command and control, right? The, the transportation system is for transportation purposes. But what we've actually asked state departments of transportation to do as of last month is instead of thinking of transportation rights of way just as transportation purposes, let's try to instead think about those rights of way for the highest and best use possible. So what we've said is for the first time, we've established a national policy 
that solar, that wind can now be cited in highway rights of way in particular at, um, at uh, diamond interchanges, at cloverleaf interchanges, and at rest areas, places where you're decelerating or where you've come to a complete stop to solve for safety, um, but to also provide additional revenue streams and to support a clean energy future, right? In addition to thinking about substantially reducing emissions, we also want to be thinking about substantially reducing waste. So this has so many co-benefits. It reduces emissions, it reduces waste, it provides state DOTs additional opportunities um, for revenue streams that, oh, by the way, are, are, um, are clean in so doing. Mm -hmm. So it promotes the right sort of incentive structures. And it also promotes the use of existing capacity, which is sort of a symptom that has ailed at least the United States transportation system for so long is yeah. just building yeah. capacity for the sake of a of, of building, which creates more induced demand. Um, so I, I, I wanted to lift up that guidance document too, um, yeah. because what we're thinking about how to best implement and, and operationalize that across our transportation system in addition to highways. It, it's a great point. And I think thinking outside of the box and innovating highest best use for different, for something like rights of ways and even air rights is something that's important as we reimagine transportation and energy. Uh, Benoit, what is the equivalent in Switzerland on, on both accounts? So you know, you've got you've got major cities in Switzerland, you have a national government, albeit it's a smaller land area, you still have a lot of players at different levels of government who have to get along and coordinate. And then to what Andrew was just talking about, what have you guys had in terms of your conversations around um, air rights and, and rights of way and using these things in different ways for essentially like wind power that maybe haven't been used before? It's a, it's a very good question, uh, Katie. And um, to illustrate that, we, we had a referendum last Sunday on a new CO2 levy, um, new CO2 law or revised CO2 law. And if you look at the results, um, you see, uh, and, and, and the, new, the revised law was refused by the Swiss citizen by 51.6%. So majority said no. And if you look at, at the Swiss map, you see the big cities, Zurich, Geneva, Bern, being green, and the rest of the country being red, with no. So it illustrates the difficulty to, to develop a strategy when people uh, are not convinced they will benefit from it, and uh, what's, uh, the, the difficulty to, to let understand that there is an investment to be done in order to reach um, uh, the climate neutrality. Mm. And if we look at the, the different experiences and, and the federal system in Switzerland is very clear based on the constitution, what are the competencies of uh, the Swiss Confederation, of the cantons and the municipalities and communes, you cannot achieve anything without committing the people on, on the local side uh, to, to address that. So it takes time, the procedures uh, are difficult, uh, but when it's decided, it's very solid uh, because the people are, are integrated in there, um, but it takes time. This is probably uh, what we can see in all the infrastructure projects we have in Switzerland. Uh, it's longer than, uh, than in different countries because you have um, uh, the possibility to, to get a referendum with 50,000 uh, signatures so that the Swiss citizen have to, to accept or not uh, a law. And uh, you have also the legal procedures if you don't accept, you don't accept uh, a project. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, as I mentioned, uh, the planification and the implication of the local uh, authorities and the local people is key in order to achieve this transition. Yeah, we saw that a lot. I was sharing with Andrew earlier that with self-driving cars, um, you know, I'm in Massachusetts, the state wanted to be able to regulate self-driving cars and the test bed for them. But we're a state where every single one of the 351 cities and towns actually gets a say in that of what happens on their roads. And so, you know, a big company that wants to come in and test cars realizes it's a very complicated fight with 351 individual cities and towns for a burden of proof. Um, well, I would like to address now something, and I know that we're coming up on time. So I think one of the last questions that I'd like to address is specifically around climate change. 
I know when we were looking in Boston around climate change, one of the things we realized is as we have sea level rise, our current public subway system may be underwater eventually. Um, you know, that was one of the models that got drawn out. So um, how are we thinking about climate change sort of as a, I don't want to be so dramatic as to say natural disaster, but we are seeing droughts, we are seeing fires, we are seeing floods, we're seeing dramatic weather events. How are you planning for transportation and energy infrastructure given that our, our climate and our world, our globe is changing? And I'd be interested to see how that's, how that's incorporated into your, into your planning processes. Andrew, we'll start with you. Sure, Katie, it's another great question. You know, from our perspective and from sort of what the president has, has laid out, um, and I'm sorry to go back to the American Jobs Plan, but this is such a compelling vision for um, what we're thinking about in terms of the administration strategy, in addition to all of the activities that I've laid out that address um, climate mitigation. We also have baked into the American Jobs Plan climate adaptation strategies as, as well, sort of. Um, to your question. So we have a $50 billion fund um, specifically for resilience. And by the way, that's also to make sure that we're not throwing good money after bad, right? Um, it, it makes absolutely no sense if we know that um, that tides are, are creeping up to be building coastal roads in the same places that we built them 50 years ago. Um, so we uh, have a fund um, to make sure that we're relocating roadways where we need to. Um, that we have strengthened evacuation routes where, where those are, are helpful, um, that we're improving you know, culvert sizes um, for water flow and, and for you know, both our, our human and our natural environment, um, that we're looking at slopes of ro roadways and that there's additional funds to support those sorts of climate resilient investments. And then we're also baking uh, resilient strategies into everything that we're doing. Right, this, this should not just be a stovepiped sort of initiative, but we're saying, regardless of whether we're talking about our airports, our seaports, our highways, our transit systems, um, that we need resilient strategies to, to boot as well. So we're making sure that there's the right sorts of eligibilities for resilience activities. And, um, and, and so th that's, I think, a, a big part of, of, of how we're solving you know, both from the mitigation standpoint, but from the adaptation standpoint as well. Yeah, and it's, and it's a, you know, not to be doom and gloomish, but it's a little bit frightening, you know, because it's unpredictable. Um, and so we want to create, so as, we, as humans, we like to create a sense of control, right? And this is one that's a little complicated. So Benoit, on your side, how are you guys thinking about uh, climate change and some of the immediate more complicated aspects of it as you're planning for a new modern transportation, and, and I know energy grid is one of your areas of expertise. Um, how are we climate proofing these things? This is, this is a huge challenge for, for Switzerland, especially for the mountains uh, region, because uh, the, the heating is get going much quicker than in other regions. So it will be uh, a big challenge. And the problem is that we have been addressing the different uh, topics in the past in, in silos, uh, agriculture, tourism, uh, transportation, uh, energy, and probably um, one of the, the key success points will be to, to combine the different, uh, the different uh, challenges. There will be enormous investment needed in order to, to be able to continue to reach Zermatt uh, behind me uh, by train or, or, or by car uh, in, in a close future. And, and we will have to combine, uh, and, and there are different examples right now that are being developed. Of course, we want to further develop uh, hydroelectricity uh, in the Alps, uh, but it will be a combined use of new uh, dams with uh, a dimension for, for energy, a dimension for water, drinking water, and the dimension to protect uh, the, the areas and the villages uh, in, in the valley. Uh, so, so this is the kind of reflection that will have to be, to be made. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, uh, enormous investments will be needed in order uh, to, to respond to the, to the climate change. Yeah, and, that, and as I started out saying, I'm, you know, I work in food systems and 
food systems are one of those critical systems. How are we going to feed ourselves and uh, climate change and transportation and energy um, definitely come into play when we're thinking about how do we make sure, as you said, Benoit, how do you reach these communities? But part of that is how do we reach and make sure that they can eat um, and that they have electricity for their basic needs? And so it's really great to hear that you're incorporating those things. Last question that I'd like you guys to end on is let's talk about our two countries together. Um, you know, we had this great uh, event talking about the ways in which Switzerland and the United States are tackling things. On the global front, what are the ways in which our two countries um, are collaborating for change, should be collaborating for change? What are the kind of things we learn from each other? And on a global scale, and it's not just Switzerland and the US, but how do we as global colleagues um, really make sure that we're getting this right. Andrew, you said it's a once in a lifetime or a generation. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna hope that there's a lot more bites at the apple, but I get the, I get the urgency. Um, so, Andrew, if you could close on sort of what is, what is this importance in this moment of the global cooperation you're seeing? Yeah, and and, and that's the point. <laughs> yes, this is, the, you know, to your point, this should not be do, doom and gloom, but this is really such a critical moment. It's such a critical opportunity. And Katie, if this is you know my only chance to do so, thank you so much for um, for convening us and and Benoit, th thanks so much for allowing me to participate with with you. I think Switzerland and in the United States, um, you know, ha have such a a, a great uh, relationship um, on on so many issues, including in the transportation sector. And I think that there's so many things that that we can build off of. Um, with our international offices and, and, and with our, our uh, respective departments. One thing that I did want to lift up, you know, that I, I mentioned at the outset was with respect to sustainable aviation fuel. I think mm -hmm. that that's an area in particular, um, you know, given sort of um, how important that is uh, globally as well as, as domestically um, to talk about, you know, sustainable aviation fuel has just such great potential for um, industries across the world in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and could cut aviation emissions by up to 80% if used more widely. Uh, mm -hmm. We see announcements and commitments by the airlines that that would lead to increase their use of sustainable aviation fuels ju just in, in recent weeks. In the United States, as part of the solution, the Biden administration has introduced a tax credit for sustainable aviation fuel production. And, and we intend to advance the development and deployment of high integrity sustainable avi aviation fuels and, and other clean technologies that meet rigorous international standards. So we look forward to working with Benoit, to working with Swiss Next, to, to working with the international community uh, to, to make sure that we're doing everything that we can um, you know, to reduce emissions across the transportation system, including in the, in the aviation sector. Yeah, in the international transportation section, that's an that's an excellent point. Thank you, Andrew, and it's been a joy to have you on the panel with us. Benoit, um, I'll turn it to you for the last words on that same topic. How how are we better together than separately? Um, yeah, you know, Switzerland is is investing a lot on research and development, uh, much more than than needed for for a small country like Switzerland. So so I really see an opportunity to, to, to combine uh, interest and to collaborate uh, in order uh, to, to develop new, new technologies, new solutions, but also, as I mentioned, for, for Swiss companies to, to address uh, a bigger market uh, with, uh, with good ideas and good products. Um, and then Switzerland can also be maybe considered by the, by the U.S. as a small laboratory yeah, with, with 8.5 million people living, I mean, uh, and with different, uh, different issues on the mountain part, uh, urban part. And, uh, and for sure, there will be uh, opportunities to, to collaborate in the close future. Yeah, I think you're I think that makes me think about how critical it is that we are funding international R&D. And we need to fund international R&D so that we can collaborate in each other's laboratories, in our own environments, in each other's environments to really get the best outcomes for all of us that we possibly can. So um, I think that's something that we can all do more of. And that, I want to thank both of you so much, Andrew and Benoit. This has been a fantastic conversation. I've learned a lot. I hope that our uh, listeners have learned a lot. And I really want to thank Swiss Next for bringing us together. And with that, I think I should probably turn it back over to the Swiss Next folks. But thank you so much, both of you, for your time. It's been a joy. Thanks, Katie.
Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.